see all these shoe boxes. We've got more coming in, so if you would stand, we're going to sing, we've a story to tell to the nations as we have the procession of the children this morning. you've ever seen. <laughs> These precious boys and girls have been so much help. They have packed boxes. They have moved boxes. These boxes have been all over the church building. And we appreciate them so much. And we've even got some more out there. Believe we're going to have 204 boxes, which averages out about three per regular tender. I know some of you have done more, but thank you, everyone you've done. This is an investment that you are making in the kingdom of God. Only God knows the results that are going to occur as a result of your sacrifice and your hard work. This is my favorite aspect about Christmas. Truly, it is more blessed to give than receive. Isn't that right? Amen. We're going to have a prayer of dedication, and the boys and girls are going to stay up here, and I'm going to try to take their picture. Rhonda, you might do better. And we're going to send it, and they're going to have their picture in the newspaper. How about that? We'll get some uh, publicity. You know, really, it's about the Lord, though. But we're going to send this picture in, and I know that they will probably print it. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that every box here would uh, be given to somebody in need, somebody who needs a Savior, somebody who needs to know how much you love them and how much we love them. I know that so many boys and girls uh, don't feel like anybody cares about them, but we know that this is an expression of care and concern and and compassion. So may each of us, Lord, look at these boxes and be reminded that we ought to be praying for the nations. Uh, Father, we are so blessed here in America. And we know your word says to whom much is given, much is required. And I pray that we would step up and do all of those things that you require us to do. Thank you, Lord, for the care of this congregation. Every time I walk in this room, I feel your presence, and I am thankful, Father, for the new families that have come in. Thank you, Lord, for these precious children. They are an incredible blessing to us. And Lord, we just love the noise and the spills and all the things that just naturally come with children. Lord, that's just a sign of growth. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, y'all stay there. Sheila, I want you to get in there. I'm going to get out. I don't like to have my picture up. 
<laughs> okay, at the count of three, y'all say chitlins. Y'all <laughs> <laughs> look at me, look at chitlins. One, two, three, chitlins. <laughs> look, hey, look at me and say it. <laughs> One, two, three, chitlins. <laughs> boys and girls. <laughs> and let me again welcome you to worship. I'm so glad you're here on this beautiful Lord's Day. Remember, right after church, we're going to have our church-wide Thanksgiving dinner. You are all invited. There is no charge for this. I'm kind of glad we're uh, a good 50 yards away from the kitchen. Because generally the kitchen is right next to the, the sanctuary and we're tormented by the smells of cooking all morning. But we're going to shut the doors and just to enjoy each other. But all of you are invited to stay. Don't forget our church-wide uh, trip to uh, Germantown and Collierville. Uh, the trip will cul culminate in a, a piano concert at Germantown Baptist Church got several grand pianos that will all be played at the same time. And they say that it is absolutely incredible. Then about the spring trip, just let us know your interest. We're going to kind of back, back up the deposits. Really, we don't have to have them in until the end of the year. That way you can kind of check and evaluate what's going on. But I'm praying that by then, we will be back to normal, whatever that means. But you just join me in praying that this will be eradicated and that we could resume uh, normal daily activities. Uh, this has been such a uh, stress on all of us, but in some way it's brought us together. You know, when you are quarantined at home with your family, it's kind of a good thing sometimes. You uh, just uh, can play together and grow together and pray together. So, again, thank you for being here. If you're a guest, uh, I just want you to join with us in worship. Don't feel like you're an outsider. You are a part of the family. And we want you to know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of Poplar Corner Baptist Church. I guess the greatest privilege of my entire ministry is serving as your pastor. Uh, God has saved the best for last. Hey, uh, and I, we're going to retire from here. Uh, and we just absolutely love you and love the privilege of serving you. So let's pray together, and then we'll move on with our song service. Father, we thank you for those who gathered for worship today. We feel your presence even right now. Uh, Father, we feel like we're on holy ground. I, I almost get tempted to remo remove my shoes because we know you are at work in this place. And I pray that everything we think, say, and do would culminate in that moment of decision that will come at the end of the sermon. Lord, that's not the two-minute warning. That is what everything is leading to. From the time we've pulled up on the parking lot, everything we have thought, said, and done points to this holy hour, and especially the culmination that's going to come. Again, we thank you for these boxes. We commit them to you. And Lord, we know that you're going to use them in a tremendous way. Uh, take charge of the service. May we not do anything that might quench your spirit or grieve your spirit, but help us to worship in such a way that you get all of the glory to which you're entitled. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. It's great to be here this morning. I am so glad to be anywhere today because I don't know about you, but we had a large storm in South Jackson last night. And I thought my house was going to blow away. But uh, thank the Lord we all made it through it. And uh, we're here today. All right, we're going to sing some songs about mission this morning to go along with our shoebox ministry. So let's stand. We're going to begin with Tell the Good News. <laughs>
and know immediately how the business is doing. You ask any coach in the world, how are you doing? That coach can look at the won and lost record and give you an instant answer. You ask any teacher, how are things going in the classroom? Now, there are a lot of different ways to evaluate effectiveness, obviously, but that teacher can look at test scores, the teacher can look at uh, attendance, behavior, all of these other means of evaluating the effectiveness of what they're doing. But it's difficult to do as a church. If I were to ask any member of Poplar Corner Baptist Church, well, how do you think we're doing? You know, I think most of the answers would be positive. Most of you would say, well, uh, things are good here. There's a good spirit. We minister and look out to each other. Attendance is somewhat picking up. You know, we are doing well as a church, but on the other hand, we are a long way from the example found in the book of Acts. Every September, every Southern Baptist church is given the responsibility of filling out the dreaded annual report. Now, you know, we're not required to. Every church is uh, independent, but it's just something that is suggested we do. We turn it into the Haywood County Baptist Association. It is a list that talks about attendance and addition and finances and all of that. I always enjoy looking at that. That is one means of our growth, but I really don't think it's the best means. I don't think it is the best indicator of how we as a church are doing. Let me make a suggestion to you. I think the best way to evaluate our effectiveness as a church is not measured on Sunday. I think the best way to measure our health and effectiveness is to look at us Monday through Saturday. How much do we look like Jesus Christ? How are we assuming the role of the body of Christ? You know, as the body of Christ, we're a mouth through which He speaks. We are hands through which He helps. We're a heart through which He loves. We're feet by which He means. How much do we look like that during the week? Do we love as Jesus Christ loved? You know, Sundays are vital. We preached last week, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You ought to be here on Sunday. By the way, you ought to be here every time we worship Sunday night and Wednesday night. We have a, a great time. But Sunday, I, I sort of think about that, think of it as the pre-game. We get motivated. We strategize. We, we make out our game plan for the week. And then uh, Monday through Saturday, we carry out those things that we've talked about on Sunday. On October 18th, 1939, a six-pound baby was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. He and his mother lived in public housing. His father was a streetcar conductor who died three months before he was born. His mother worked at a nursing home for $6 a day. His mother had been arrested three times for beating up the boy's father. She was very crude and cruel and abusive to her two children. This little boy was an absolute genius. His IQ was 150 which is a lot more than mine. He was a total genius. He could memorize long passages at a time. But his entire life was characterized by truancy and poverty and fights and rebellion and brushes with the law. He failed three grades in school. He finally dropped out of school and joined the Marines. He did well as a Marine. He was an expert marksman. But he was dishonorably discharged because he stole a Jeep and never returned it. He couldn't keep a job. 
He moved 36 times before his 21st birthday, including a couple of years in Russia where he met and married a beautiful woman. In seventh grade, his guidance counselor wrote this. He does not know the meaning of unconditional love. His marine file says he is convinced that the world hates him. They did a very painstaking study of his life after he died. In fact, that study compiled 16 volumes. And in that study, they told of some occasions whereby this young man who lived right next door to a Baptist church was asked to leave. He would go over there and try to mix and mingle, but because he was dirty and foul-mouthed and had a quick temper, on many occasions he was asked to leave and never come home, and never come back. Well, apparently that had a tremendous effect on him. He just desired acceptance and notoriety. One day he received the attention that he had craved his entire life. On November 22nd, 1963, as President John F. Kennedy's car made a sharp left in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, that young man, Lee Harvey Oswald, squeezed off three shots, killing the president uh, immediately. Two days later, Lee Harvey himself was murdered. Everybody has asked the question, why did he do it? A smart fellow like him should have been a great success. Why did he do it? Why did he shock the world and deprive us of a good president? All because of that desire for attention. You know, I'm not an attorney, and I'm not a psychiatrist, but I have a hunch why he did it. I suspect that nobody loved him like Jesus loved him. To the world, he was nothing but a misfit and a troublemaker. He was somebody that people avoided. He was someone, when parents drove down a street, they would say, don't end up like that guy. No one ever saw him through the eyes of Jesus. Like I said, to the world, he was a misfit and a troublemaker uh, and somebody who was to be avoided by polite society. But to Jesus Christ, he was precious. He was created in the image of God. He was worthy of the love of God and the acceptance of God. Jesus Christ loved Lee Harvey Oswald so much that he gave his life for him. Uh, an open enemy of the gospel, a man who professed atheism and communism and socialism, but Jesus loved him so much that he was willing to give his life for him. You know, on this day, when we collect boxes for Operation Christmas Child, I think it is essential that we be reminded that if we are going to make a difference for Jesus Christ, if we're going to be his eyes and hands and feet uh, and heart, if we're going to be that lighthouse that Jesus has assigned us to be, it is imperative that we see people as Jesus Christ see, sees them. There's a human tendency to categorize everybody. You know, black, white, rich, poor, male, female, Educated, uneducated, employed, unemployed. Yeah, I think the only way that we ought to see people as every one of them is worthy of the love of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ. Everyone is either headed to heaven or headed to hell. Everyone is on the narrow road or that broad road. That is the only way that we ought to categorize people. We ought to say to everyone, this is somebody worthy of my love. This is someone worthy of, a, of an example of what a believer is all about. This is somebody I want to reach out to because no one else has. You know, people who are prominent, you know, we reach out to them. 
We want to be their friends, but people who are misfits and ignored and just kind of living on the edges of society, we tend to marginalize them. In this passage, Jesus is traveling through Caesarea. That is the northern part of Palestine, up by the Sea of Galilee. This was, was Jesus' headquarters. His entire ministry was going up and down and up and down and up and down. But he spent most of his time in the northern part of Palestine. Uh, one of the activities in which he was involved was calling a new disciple. He walked by and an IRS agent named Matthew was sitting at his desk. Matthew was a Jew and he worked for the Romans. And he was allowed by the Romans, in fact he was encouraged to use any means fair or foul to extract money from people. He could take away property. He could even take away children. He was a wicked, hated man. But Jesus went by his desk, said, follow me. Matthew immediately followed. I don't know, but Matthew has probably only been a follower of Jesus for a few weeks. And he's closely observing Jesus and recording what he saw. Jesus had been busy. He had a uh, restored a young girl back to life. He had healed a woman with a 12-year sickness. She made her way through the crowd and touched Jesus and was immediately healed. He uh, healed two blind men. He loosened the tongue of a mute man. Matthew was observing all of that. And finally, he writes down his conclusion. He says, okay, I've seen Jesus do all of this, what can I conclude? What can I say as I wrap up this chapter for the glory of God? What are the observations that Matthew makes? Number one, I want you to notice with me what Matthew, uh, what Matthew, or excuse me, what Jesus saw. What Jesus saw. In the last part of verse 36, he sees them as harassed and helpless, weary and scattered, my translation reads. The Barclay translation says they were mangled and thrown to the ground. That is what Jesus saw. He didn't see a bunch of people, you know, milling around waiting for a meal. He saw people who were genuinely beat down by life. The word weary that's used there is a Greek word that refers to being worn out from a never-ending journey. Think about a gerbil on a, a wheel. Think about an exerciser on a treadmill. Just moving and moving and moving, not making any progress whatsoever. Constantly running but getting nowhere at all. And it has taken toll on no one's emotional and spiritual and physical health. It's taken a toll on one's relationships. That's what Jesus saw. He also saw people who were scattered. The word scattered refers to somebody who's lying in a gutter and cannot get up. You remember the old commercial? We made a lot of fun of it. I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> I need this clicker. Uh, the next time I fall, so somebody will come and attend to my needs. That's what Jesus saw. People who were metaphorically lying in a gutter, unable to help themselves up. From time to time, sheep will get so heavy laden with wool, and they'll get so fat that they will just literally roll over on their backs, and they're stuck in that position. They cannot get back up at all. And, you know, they will die. Their limbs are just dangling in the air. And, you know, they're like us. Eventually, the blood's going to drain out. And they're going to go numb. Well, the shepherd will come along and will pick the sheep up and will carry him on his shoulders until the sheep has recovered enough to be able to stand on his own. That is called a sheep being cast. C-A-S-T. You know, the psalmist asked, why are you cast down, 
Oh, my soul, why are you on your back with your feet dangling in the air? We have a Savior who comes and, and makes us right. You know, there are billions of people who are cast. They're on their back, limbs dangling in the air. And Operation Christmas Child is one way that we can get them back on the right path. One way we can demonstrate to them that we love them and we care about them. But, but let me tell you, it, it's, it's pretty easy to assemble a box. It's pretty easy to write a check. They're not a person in here who can't write a check for nine bucks to pay for a box. That, that is kind of the, the easy part. The more difficult part is to make a concerted effort to go to people in our family, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our schoolroom, and say to them, you know, I love you, and God loves you, and He's got a wonderful plan for your life. I, I guess just another way to say this, Jesus saw shepherdless sheep. You know, when the Bible calls us sheep, that's not a compliment. It's not a testimony about how cute and cuddly we are. When the Bible calls us sheep, uh, it, it means that we have the qualities of a sheep. You know, sheep have no innate sense of direction. That you know, they'll wander off. They have no ability to find food and water. They have no ability to, to protect themselves. They can't buck like a horse. <laughs> they can't scratch like a tiger or bite like a lion or run like a gazelle. They are totally vulnerable. That's why they need a shepherd. In the very same way, we don't have any way to protect ourselves. We can't find anything that will uh, sustain us for all of eternity. We need a shepherd to come along and just take us on his shoulders and nuzzle us and let us know how much he loves us. So that's what Jesus saw. Number two, what did Jesus feel? Let's look at what Jesus felt. Again, in verse 36, it says he felt compassion to them. That is a Greek word that means to agitate or to churn. You put your clothing in the washing machine this morning and the agitator started going just like that or just like that. It was stirring up the clothing. It didn't want the clothing just to lie there at the bottom of the machine. It started sort of shaking up the clothing to make sure the clothing is cleaned uh, uh, maximally. You know, you don't want the clothing to come out still dirty. That's what Jesus felt toward people. I want to clean them up. I want to shake up their lives. I want to do anything I can to show them how much I love them. You know, compassion means more than just sadness. I can watch the end of Old Yeller a hundred times and I'll be wiping my eyes every single time. It, it's just, it's sad. A lot of things make us sad. When I see those television commercials about all the abandoned dogs, you know, the dogs that nobody wants, that breaks my heart. And I've, I've often wanted to write in, if you want donations, don't show commercials like that because I've always got to turn the channel because it makes me so sad. A lot of things make us sad, but they don't really move us to action at all. Compassion means we see something and we are moved to action. We just cannot sit there at all. I think the best thing for the American church would be to have our hearts broken again. You know, when's the last time your heart has been broken over lost people who live within a half mile of the walls of this church? Let me share something with you. Every hour in the world, there are 7,000 babies born into poverty. 20% of them will be dead by their second birthday. Uh, across the world in the next hour, 723,000 teenagers will take their first drink, and one-third of them will become alcoholics. Every hour in the world, 360,000 babies will die of malnutrition. You've all seen the babies with the bloated bellies and the ribs that are exposed. 360,000 of them will die in the next hour. 
In the next hour, 9,000 people will commit suicide. In the next hour, 75,000 will commit their very first crime. 40,000 will enter prison for the very first time. And in the next hour across the world, 66,000 drug transactions will take place with a value of $500 million. You know, that ought to break our hearts. That ought to be more than just cold, black and white writing on a white paper. You know, these represent people for whom Jesus died. These uh, represent people created in the image of God. They ought to break our hearts. In April 1999, a couple of high school seniors murdered 13 kids at Columbine High School and wounded 21 others. Their names were Eric Harris and Dylan Clebo. That week, Time Magazine on the cover had these words, the monsters next door. They were absolute monsters and every one of us could agree with that except Jesus Christ. You know, we call them monsters. Jesus calls them worthy of my compassion. Somebody I absolutely love. You know, I wonder what Jesus thinks of Adolf Hitler. I wonder what Jesus thinks of Joseph Stalin. I wonder what Jesus thinks of Osama bin Laden. You know, we know the answer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we've considered what Jesus saw and what Jesus felt, finally, what Jesus did. He saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them, and that moved him to action. He couldn't just sit there and do nothing. Verse 35 tells what he did. Notice it says he went through every town and village. He didn't exclude anybody. Every village in the area needed a touch from his healing and restoring hand. In other words, Jesus practiced net fishing rather than line fishing. Any of y'all fishermen or fisherwomen? Sometimes you practice line fishing. There's a certain fish you want to catch. You want to catch crappie. That's my favorite kind of fish. You go out there, you've got a special bait, a special line to catch that crappie. Other times, you'll just take anything. You throw a net out there. And you may catch a harp or two. You may catch an old rubber boot. You just take whatever you can. Jesus practiced net fishing rather than line fishing, and so should we. It says, first of all, he taught in the synagogues. He was helping people to understand the deep things of God. Very few of them knew anything about the Word of God. Very few of them could even read. And in those days, the rabbis kind of kept the Word of God from the people. Because if the people knew about the grace and love and patience of God, it would change their lives. And these rabbis wanted things the way they were. They loved the status quo. So Jesus went and taught in the synagogue. Then it says that he preached the good news. The good news, you know this, is the Greek word euangelion. We get the word evangelism from that. Jesus went and evangelized all of these communities. Gave them some good news. Shared the gospel. You remember the song back in the 1980s? I'm dating myself here. Remember that song by Ann Murray, We Sure Could Use a Little Good News Today? <laughs> Every one of us could use some good news today. Especially those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and then it said that he went about healing people. Uh, relieving their immediate needs so that they can hear the gospel. You've heard this old phrase. They will never care how much we know until they know how much we care. Jesus demonstrated how much he cared by 
interacting with them and healing those. And, you know, as I see it, that's our threefold commission uh, at Poplar Corner Baptist Church. We're obligated to be teaching people the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, making disciples of them. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Didn't say go and make converts. He said, go and make disciples, growing followers of Jesus Christ. And then we ought to be involved in preaching. I'm not the only preacher here. You know, I'm the one who has the office and the salary and the parsonage and the pulpit. But I'm not the only preacher here. You're a preacher as well. You can go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And then we ought to be involved in healing. You know, not necessarily physical healing, but emotional healing and relational healing. Healing hearts and minds and marriages and hopes and dreams. On March 13th, 1964, a heinous crime took place on 168th Avenue in Queens, New York. A 21-year-old girl named Kitty Genovese was on her way home from work. Where she worked was just a few blocks away, so she walked home. As she approached the home where she lived with her parents and two sisters, someone attacked her and stabbed her to death on that city street. Over 70 stab wounds. When the New York City Police Department arrived to investigate that horrific murder, you know what they discovered? They discovered that 38 people were aware of what was happening. 38 people looked out the window. 38 people heard her screams. And 38 people turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to what was happening. You know, right now we have an adversary and he is beating up on people. And he's disrupting marriages and mental states and jobs and what have you. And listen, folks, we've got to get involved. We don't have the luxury of just looking the other way. We don't have the luxury of just ignoring what we see all around us. We are the last line of defense for them. You know, if, if we neglect people's physical needs, you know, that's a shame, but there are people who may step up to the plate. There are organizations that will feed them. There are organizations that will take them in and give them a roof over their head. There are organizations who help them with rent and utilities and clothing. But you know, if, if we neglect people's spiritual needs, there is no one else to help them. Nobody else is going to step in. You know, we are celebrating good things that are happening in Poplar Corner Baptist Church. I, I believe God is at work, but don't lose sight of the fact uh, amongst our celebration. Don't lose sight of the fact that we live in a world whereby two-thirds do not know Jesus Christ. You can sort of divide the world in thirds. One-third of the world, nine billion, one-third know Jesus Christ as Savior. Another one-third, three billion, have heard the name, but they don't know anything about him. Then one-third, three billion, have never even heard the news of Jesus Christ. So don't allow our celebration to keep us from understanding what's going on out there. In 1996, the city of Houston, Texas, went all summer long without a drowning in a city pool, 47 city pools. And nobody tried. That was the first time in decades. And on Labor Day, or over the Labor Day weekend, all of the lifeguards got together and held a party to celebrate that fact. You can probably imagine what happened during the party. Two people drowned in the midst of that party. Here were people celebrating. And in the midst of that celebration, two people drowned. So going back to my initial question, you may be asking, uh, well, Pastor, you've been here two months, two months today, as a matter of fact. You've been here two months. 
How do you think we're doing? What grade would you give us? Well, I'm going to equivocate on you. First of all, I would say, well, you know, I really can't give us a grade. Only God can. But then if you push me, I would say, well, I would give us an I, an incomplete. You know, you cannot assign a grade until the course is finished. And the course is not finished for Poplar Corner Baptist Church. We were established in 1966. We've grown. We've been a lighthouse for Jesus Christ. But the final chapter has not been written. So I'm going to give us an incomplete an opportunity for us to get the grade up. An opportunity for us to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and hear Him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, you say, what can we do between now and then? I would suggest we hit the reset button and we start seeing what Jesus saw and we start feeling what Jesus felt and we start doing what Jesus did. Maybe this morning, God, the supreme optometrist, has been at work. And you've seen things that you've just not seen previously. And you have sort of a eureka moment. And you understand your responsibility before God. You know, 1 John 2, 6 says, Whoever claims to belong to Him must walk as He walked. We need to follow this example if we are believers. Uh, there are those of you this morning who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope in some strange way I have described for you how much He loves you. How compassionate and patient and forgiving. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. Jesus Christ can save you. It may be 1159 and holding for you. But Jesus Christ can save you. And you'll start loving what you used to hate. And you'll start hating what you used to love. Others of you ought to come and unite with Papa Corner Baptist Church. We've got a proud past, but I think we have a promising future. And let me tell you, this is the most compassionate, loving, ministry-minded church in Haywood County. I'd say in all of West Tennessee. And when you join us, you're going to be part of a family. You're going to have brothers and sisters who will look in on you and, and care for you. We want you to come and be a part of what God's doing here. In just a moment, Brother John's going to come and lead us in a hymn of commitment. The ladies are going to make their way to the instruments. And as soon as we stand to our feet, I want you to step out. You know, the longer you stand there, the more difficult it is. You know, maybe you've gripped that pew until your knuckles are white. But let today be the day when you wave the white flag of surrender and say, Jesus Christ, I'm giving my life and my all to you. So let's stand together and see when you make that decision.